Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Wash Shu, my next guest, is a writer. His work covers a lot of ground. He's written profiles and reviews in The New Yorker, covering artists and performers like Bjork, Bell Hooks, and Sandra Oh. He's also a professor of English, with a passion for elevating underappreciated talent in literature. He wrote his first book, A Floating Chinaman, about the writer H.T. Tsong. Song was an undocumented immigrant from China who self-published his books initially, handing out copies around Manhattan. Lately, Hua has been writing more reflective work. His new book, Stay True, is a memoir. In Stay True, Xu looks back on his early 20s, when he was an undergrad at the University of California, Berkeley. His mom was maybe an hour or so away by car. His dad was overseas in Taiwan working as an engineer. In the dorms, he made and lost friends. He writes about road trips with buddies. He shares correspondence with his father. It's a book about his most intimate relationships and their interrelationship with his Americanness. It's also a sort of tragic love story. We'll get into all of that in our conversation. For now, I just want to say Stay True is a really special book. It's beautifully written, casually incisive, and spectacularly moving. I'm really grateful that I got to talk to Vashu about it, so let's get into it. Vashu, welcome to Bullseye. It's so nice to get to talk to you. It's awesome to be here. I was really excited. Look, we're going to talk about real things in a moment. But I was just really excited to learn that you grew up a San Francisco Giants fan. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's the information. Were you like a like a Joel Youngblood guy? I, I did like Joel Youngblood. Um, I think Mike Kruko was one of my first favorite Giants. I think it was 1986 was when I started following them. So, you know, Will Clark, Chris Spire, Chris Brown. These are classics. Candy Maldonado. I still think about how Mike Aldredi never wore the uh, batting gloves. <laughs> it seems like from your book that you're a pretty serious baseball fan, or at least were. What did baseball mean to you? That's a that's an interesting question. Yeah, I was I really got into baseball, but much like me getting in music, I think it was more that I got this device and I needed to use the device to do something with. If that makes sense, like. But I still remember my parents, circa 1986, bought a television, and they were giving a free AM portable radio, and I inherited that. And I started listening to KNBR, which was the Giants' flagship station, because it was like one of the only stations this AM radio could get. And I just became obsessed with carrying this radio around, listening to it during dinner, taking it on road trips, um, listening to it on the way to school. And so I just obsessively listened to KNBR, which I think in the mid-1980s, a lot of those AM stations were still talk-oriented, but it was like pretty local. Um, And I just happened to start listening to Giants games, and it just became... I don't think I was really drawn to baseball. I just kind of accidentally started obsessively listening to baseball games on the radio, and then I got into it that way. I think a lot about a guy who used to call in to KNBR, and I guess it would have been the early 90s, he would call into Gary Radnich's mm-hmm. show, sort of legendary Bay Area sportscaster. And his name was Johnny the Gout Man. <laughs> and the thing that I remember most vividly is that one day during a commercial break, Gary Radnich looked up what exactly gout was and came back on the air just really worried about Johnny the Gout <laughs> Man. <laughs> it is a very like as someone who also grew up obsessively listening to that very same radio station and especially baseball games it's a very easy world to get lost in yeah i can understand what you mean by using it as a tool yeah i think that 
I think I was just really into listening to the radio when I was younger. Like I was an only child. I loved kind of curating the world around me. I was the type of kid who had posters on top of my other posters and just my room was just filled with stuff and everything just was this sensory trigger. And, you know, I just love the world of the radio. You know, I just love this idea that there was this new technical language to master, listening to baseball. People just wielded their opinions with an authority that I didn't really feel in my own life. It was just really cool. I mean, I still love listening to sports talk. But similarly, you know, I didn't get into music necessarily because I loved music. What happened was like I got a bumper sticker for a local radio station and I put it on my binder and I thought, well, I guess I have to start listening to this radio station now that I've, you know, gone through the trouble of putting this on my binder and asking for people to basically ask me if I actually listen to this radio station. What are we talking about? Live 105, <laughs> the rock of the 90s? It was, it, it was, it quickly became Live 105, but initially it was KSJO 92.3, which was the... I think I don't know if it was San Jose, but it was South Bay Hard Rock. So it was kind of like Guns N' Roses, Metallica, that kind of stuff. But it was just a bumper sticker I saw around a lot. And one day I found one, put it on my binder, and I was like, well, I guess I should start actually listening to music now. Because my dad was into music, but as a result of him being into music, I thought music was kind of uncool and, and something only adults were into. So uh, KSJO... Cameo, Live 105, like that sort of, that became the next thing after listening to obsessively to baseball games. I'm really interested in the way that your dad talks about music as he writes to you, which you reproduce in the book, and the way you talk about your dad's relationship to music. He was a first generation immigrant from Taiwan. And there's like this little moment in the book where you talk about what listening to Bob Dylan must have meant to him mm -hmm. as a guy who, when he started listening to it, probably couldn't really understand the lyrics. What did you think about your dad's taste in music when you were a kid? When I was a kid, I, I thought nothing of my dad's taste in music because I think when you're, when you're young, you either like idolize your parents or you kind of ignore them. And I mean, I looked up to my parents, but I didn't, I wasn't particularly interested in, in their interests. And so the fact that my dad always wanted to, you know, go to Tower Records after dinner, I didn't think it was a particularly, like, interesting way to spend your time. I would rather just stay at home and listen to Giants games on the radio. But eventually, I think when I got into music, when I realized that there was this kind of social currency to being this middle school kid who who had CDs or who had access to, to new sounds. I thought a lot more about like why they liked the things they liked and you know maybe even projected what I thought they, they saw in these artists. So my dad was really into Bob Dylan, Neil Young, um, Aretha Frank. Like he was just sort of a typical person coming of age in the 1950s, 1960s and 70s. Uh, when he got to the United States in the early 70s, he was pretty much just into classical music. Like I think he'd heard, you know, Elvis, the Beatles, stuff like that. And it was while he was living in this boarding house, I think in Amherst, Massachusetts, another person in the boarding house, like I think like a young hippie guy, was just constantly blasting Dylan. And initially my dad thought it was the worst thing he'd ever heard. And eventually he just grew really accustomed to Dylan's voice. And he ordered, he was part of the Columbia Music Club, you know, like that thing that, I was a part of many years later where you pay a penny and then you get fleeced buying a, a few things in order to like get a bunch of other things for a penny. Um, and he started ordering Dylan records and Janis Joplin records. And, you know, he eventually got into the full on kind of rock counterculture. You know, my parents are probably about the same age as your parents. And, uh, you know, my dad used to tell me stories about hiding under his blankets or uh, hiding out in the basement so he could listen to Ray Charles without his parents hitting him. Or, you know, my mom used to tell me stories about going to the RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. to see the mothership with her friend Claudia. Wow. And, like, I wondered as I read about your dad's passion for this, 
you know, for a lot of this same music. I mean, like we're talking about great music, also kind of classic boomer dad music. Mm -hmm. And I thought like, gosh, he landed in that same place in such a different way Yeah, <laughs> from <laughs> my parents sort of like, you know, American graffiti <laughs> or whatever <laughs> version of that. Were you, were you aware of that when you were a kid or a teenager? Probably not. I mean, I think as a, as a teenager, I was not thinking deeply about any of this stuff. Uh, but I think, you know, when I got a little bit older, like maybe when I got to college and I thought about, and, and I started basically taking my dad's records and absorbing them into my record collection, you know, I would think about what these sounds might have represented for him. You know, there are things that he liked listening to. Like one of his favorite songs is The Animal's House of the Rising Sun. I mean, that's that's a song about, like, sin in this very— it's, like, aggressively about sin. But I don't think he necessarily hears it that way or, or thinks about it that way. Like, I don't think he was mining music for, lesson, for, for lyrical lessons for how to be. But I think these songs, these sounds, these poses did— I don't know, I think they taught him something about being American, you know, or being someone in the West. He wasn't— he was basically by himself in the United States. Eventually, his brothers and sisters moved here. You know, eventually, he and my mom got married. But I think for a lot of those first generation immigrants, you know, you're you're sort of adrift. You're sort of on your own, and so I, you know, he wouldn't have had that experience of of having to deal with what other people in his family thought about his interests because his interests comprise like such a huge part of who he was becoming, you know, and who he could become. How old were you when your dad moved back to Taiwan for work? It was, I remember it in part because the 1989 World Series was one of, <laughs> was when the, the, the Loma Prieta earthquake, and I remember he wasn't there for that. So I think it was around 1988, 1987, perhaps, that he'd moved back to Taiwan, and my mother and I stayed in uh, Cupertino, which was a city that nobody knew at the time, but now everyone has uh, preconceptions about. Why did your dad move to Taiwan? I think ultimately he moved because there were just there just more opportunities. Like he had been, he'd come to the United States to get a graduate education. You know, he he had these minor dreams of going into academia. You know, make, maybe becoming a professor. Uh, that didn't really pan out, and so he became an engineer. And we lived in Texas for a while, then we moved to Southern California, and eventually the Bay Area. I think he just got tired of the American corporate ladder. Like It just seemed like there were more opportunities for career advancement, for um, doing the kinds of things he wanted to do back in Taiwan. And you know, living in Cupertino, it was the type of place where it wasn't actually that unusual for your dad to move back to Taiwan to work and for the rest of the family to stay behind. Like, I would go to the airport for winter break and just see my classmates, and we were all either like going to Taiwan together or picking up our dads. And so, I mean, it wasn't like so common, but it was common enough where it, it made it seem like, you know, this is just an arrangement that people can have. Like, this is another version of a family. Um, so I think he went in part just to kind of see what, what he could actually do in this new industry of semiconductors. More with Hua Shu after the break. Stay with us. It's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. Welcome back to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. If you're just joining us, I'm talking with writer Hua Shu. He's a professor of English at Bard College, a staff writer for The New Yorker, and he has a new memoir called Stay True. The book is about the relationships that defined his adolescence and young adulthood and how they reflected and refracted his relationship with his own Americanness. Let's get back into our conversation. In a way, your dad became kind of a double immigrant because of how much yeah, absolutely. Taiwan had changed while he was in the United States and, and because so much of his personal world had transferred 
to the States in the time that, you know, a- after he after he made the move. Yeah. And th- I mean, this is one thing that I've talked to them about. And there is this sort of, I don't want to say, it, th- there's this sort of trope within kind of Asian American kids of my generation. You know, if, you're, if your parents, if your parents were the immigrants and you were raised here, there's this trope that they sacrifice everything for you, right? That they came to this country, that they endured all of that loneliness, that confusion. They had to sort of piece their careers together. They did it all so that you could have a life here, right? And that as a result of this, people of my generation, like 1.5, second generation, like we have this indebtedness to our parents. And, you know, I think that's certainly true. Like I do feel indebted to them in some way, but I remember having a conversation with them about how like, you know, it's like incredible that you made all these sacrifices so that I could have this life in America. And my dad was like, "Uh, I didn't actually do any of that for you. Like when we left Taiwan in the 1970s, you know, there wasn't that much there. It wasn't necessarily a prosperous place. And so we left for ourselves and you happen to have come along, but you don't need to feel as though we sacrificed anything for you. Like we did that on our own for ourselves. And it was really interesting to hear that because it was a story that I'd been telling myself so much, right? Just that there's this thing that bonds us. And, you know, we, there is still a thing that bonds us, but it's much more nuanced than, um, than the lessons I'd learned in class. You grew into a kind of classic alternative teen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you would write back and forth to your dad in Taiwan. You you and your mom would go stay in Taiwan during breaks and in the summer and so forth. You'd all be together. But in the times that you were in the States during the school year, you would send each other faxes. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's such an unusual medium for intimate communication. Yeah, yeah. It is because faxes are so corporate, you know. Yeah. I mean, do people is it is it common knowledge what faxes are even? I have no idea. <laughs> I had to I had to find a fax machine a year or two ago to to fax something to someone, but yeah, I mean, I think people people remember the fax machine if they're at least if they're over uh 30 or so, I would guess, right? But it was the first instantaneous text slash picture communications that most of us had any access to, but, but mostly they lived, you know, I never had a fax machine and I lived most of my life in the fax machine era. Yeah. It was just that it was something that law firms used to send messages to each other. (laughs) Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't really something for household use, you know, um, because even though it was this pretty novel form of communication, the way it worked, like it would print on this thermal paper and it would just, it would never look as good as whatever the original letter was. So that might be fine for a document, but, you know, it just feels as though this, this letter that you've written your father or that your father's written you has been like run through like a a washing machine or something. Like it just, everything just arrives looking a little bit off. It's curly and smudgy. Yeah. Yeah. There's a letter in the book uh, your father faxed you that I, I was so touched by that it was one of those things where I was I was reading your book next to my wife in bed, and I made her stop doing whatever she was doing so I, I could read it to her. And it's, in a way, pretty kind of quotidian for for being so touching. Maybe it's touching because it's so quotidian, but I wondered if you might, if you might read it for us. Sure. And you... S- you say that this is this is something that he wrote you after he he was concerned that that he had been too stern with you in a previous message. Yeah, I I think um I mean so much of so much of my book is about things that you don't realize till much later, right? Which is I think just how life generally is. Like it's hard to you know that you should be present. It's hard to be present. And it's impossible basically to be present when you're a teenager. And so I think whenever my father would be too stern with me or, you know, whenever he would be 
you know, maybe he felt like he'd been overly critical. I probably didn't register it as such, but he would always sort of write this follow up and be like, uh, I just need to like explain why I have worry or why I have concern or, or why I said what I said. So I'll just read it now. Last Friday, I overemphasized the toughness. Don't be scared. The life is full of excitement and surprises. Handle it and enjoy it. Just like you said that you like the cross-country exercise. After climbing the hill, looking downward, you feel good. That is the point I'd like to make. Don't feel frustrated climbing, climbing. Also, don't pick a too high mountain to climb in, begin with. You need to drill the small hill first. Learn from the exercise. Even a tumble can teach you how to climb next time. It's sweating, but enjoy the process. Mom and I have been proud of you, not only on your accomplishment, but more on your happy personality. We'll support you, whatever you choose. Most time, ha. Huh. Don't feel bad if sometimes we are too nervous. We just hope to give you all our guidance and help to make your decisions simpler. We might put too much pressure on you, but that's not what we mean. Be relaxed, but arrange your time to handle priorities. I feel sorry that I cannot be around all the time to support you in whatever you need. But I feel comfortable since mom can do a good job and you are quite mature. But if there's any thoughts or problem, call me or fax me. If it's classwork and you cannot get my timely help, please tell us. We can arrange some tutoring. 10th and 11th grade take more sweat, but I hope you enjoy them. Love, Dad. In so many of these letters, your father asks you what you think. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that we always associate with parental wisdom. It was something that I thought was a really conspicuous choice that your dad made to connect with you in that way. Yeah, and it's fascinating to me because I don't know that he was making a choice. You know, when we when we talk back then and even now, he tends to favor uh, the monologue to the uh, to the spirited um, tete a tete. But you know, he's very curious. Like he is always asking me these questions that I often can't actually answer. Like I remember after it might have been after the the Angels Giants World Series of two thousand three was it two thousand two two thousand three it but it was after some sort of crushing loss to a team that I was deeply invested in you know he was like why do people like sports and he didn't he didn't mean that in in this way he wasn't being critical you know or he wasn't really trying to like troll me but he he really wanted to know like philosophically, like what is it about watching competition that like you feel invested in? And, you know, like I've learned over the years that like when he asks me questions like that, he he actually wants to know why I like sports, like why people like sports. Um, and so, yeah, he remains this, this very curious person, um, although he's probably more opinionated than he, he comes across in some of these, uh, some of the facts that I reproduced. When you went to college, you went to college at UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. what was your first cultural impression of meeting people who were mostly from all over California, but also all over the, all over the country? You know, so I went to Berkeley and... One of the things that drew me to Berkeley was I was really into high school debate. And so I went to Berkeley for a debate tournament, I think my junior year. And it was it was like the best two days of my life up until that point. Like it was the first time a girl held my hand. Like it was the first time I, you know, could just walk down the street and buy slices of pizza. Um, like I would in between rounds at the, of the debate tournament, I would, we would just like wander around Telegraph, like looking, and, the, and I was just overwhelmed by how many places there were to buy stuff that I was into, whether it was like magazines, CDs, records, books, and- Bumper stickers it, that said visualize world peace. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I already had this impression that um, like I had to go to this place because- it was just filled with the things I liked. Therefore, it must also be filled with people just like me, you know, 
who are buying those things. And the summer before I started at Berkeley, I was like a counselor at a debate camp in Berkeley. So I was there for the summer. And like debaters are like pretty weird people. So everyone was like into punk rock or like, you know, a chain smoker or just sort of like into uh, into communism. And so I had this really inflated sense of like what the average Berkeley student was going to be like based on these experiences. And so when I finally moved into the dorms, I moved in with two of my really good friends from high school. But in a way, I was kind of like, you know, we're good friends, but I'm going to make other friends here who are way more like my people, like people who are going to recognize why I dress the way I do or or why I, I buy records versus CDs, you know. And yeah, I was shocked by how many people were just from Southern California and they were almost exactly like the people from Northern California, except they called 101 the 101 or 280, like <laughs> the 280. And I was honestly kind of disappointed. I was like, I thought there would be way more like cool people, the square quotes, like very specific sense of what that meant for me at the time um, at Berkeley in my dorm. And there weren't. There were just a lot of people from Los Angeles, a lot of people from like a, a nearby high school, the one I went to, a lot of people from my high school, um, and a few people from places that by virtue of not being Northern California or Los Angeles seemed exotic, like Bakersfield or San Diego. Yeah. And so it took me a while to actually just wrap my head around and appreciate kind of the diversity of California and just the the people who are there at Berkeley with me. But, you know, it also took me a while to find like the other kid who is wearing like a, an old mechanics jacket or or vans or, or whatever it was I was I was into. The main person that you write about from your college years was one of your first best pals in college, a guy named Ken, who mm -hmm. was from the San Diego area and was different from you in a lot of ways, not super alternative, very handsome and charismatic and chill in a particularly San Diegan way. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, there's a part where you talk <laughs> about him describing just like how pretty and happy everyone is in Southern California. Yeah. And I was like, that sounds like hell to me. <laughs> One of the fine distinctions that you point out about his difference from you is that, you know, at Berkeley, especially in the 90s, you were joined together by virtue of both being Asian American, but he was Japanese American and you know, Japanese American culture in California runs often many generations deep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are there are a lot of Japanese American people who are sixth and eighth generation Californians relative to Taiwanese people, uh, where there are a lot of people whose families came around when you're a state. Yeah. What was the significance of that difference to the two of you like what was it like for you to walk around and probably have people see both of you as it, two asian american guys hanging out when you had that very different cultural context yeah i mean when we first met he was someone who i just instantly dismissed um and and it's hap i i tend to be be like that where i'll just say like oh, i'll never be friends with that person and then next thing i know i'm like this is this is like my person you know but he was this frat guy from San Diego. I didn't think we had anything really in common uh, because we were into such different things. But, you know, one of the things we would talk about a lot in a very unformed way, a very unacademic way, because like we hadn't taken the classes or, or studied the history yet, was just, you know, how different our experiences were as Asian Americans and yet how indistinguishable we would be to most other people. You know, it's not like there's so many Asian Americans that it's a distinction that that's familiar, I think, to people within the community, but it's such a small community that it's not a distinction that anyone outside of it really notices, right? Just the sense that there are people whose families came 
in the 1800s, the early 1900s. There are people who came before the civil rights era and after the civil rights era. And so for me, even growing up in the South Bay, I would always look at Japanese Americans because they often came, you know, they'd gone through World War II, like their families had been part of Japanese internment. Their parents spoke with no accent. They seemed just more Americanized than my family. And he was instantly someone I recognize as as that. Like I, I felt like his ability to be more comfortable in his own skin, in my mind, I projected onto him was like the result of him being this like, you know, second or third generation Japanese American. Uh, whereas for me, you know, like even though I appreciated my my family and like, you know, the route that took us to Cupertino, you know, there's just, there are still these moments where you feel a bit like an outsider or a bit kind of marginal. And it didn't bother me as much, but it was always eye-opening to see these people who were like so much more comfortable in these spaces. Was it hard to imagine yourself being friends with someone who was, who had the comfort of being handsome and charismatic? No, it was more that it was just unexpected. You know, I think it was one of those things where, um, you know, college just allows you this opportunity to reboot your personality. You can do it at a UC. You could probably do it like eight times, right? Because it's so such a big school. You're just going to be in, in new classes surrounded by new people every semester. So it, it it wasn't something I thought about, but it was more like, oh, it's kind of, it's it's funny that like, you know, I have these friends who are so different from me, particularly this friend. But, you know, over time you realize that the people who stick around, the people who are patient and open with you, you know, those are the, those are the friendships that actually last. And so, yeah, I think very quickly I became really, I don't know, just really happy that, that I had this, this person who was this confidant and sounding board, but who did not see the world the way I did. One of the things that the two of you obsessed over together was the kind of tropes of pop culture, the world of the like slightly generic sitcoms mm -hmm. and things like that. And especially the like little ways that Asian Americans would be glimpsed within them. Mm -hmm. Is there one that you remember particularly from those days, uh, a little something that you obsessed over? Not really, because there were, there were so few, you know, so I didn't really, you know, you would notice things, but this was pre, pre YouTube. So, you know, we had this, these lists we would write down, but it was just sort of like a memory you thought you once had, you know. But I, I do remember one thing that we talked about a lot was how, um, like, the real world casting director came to his frat house. Um, I read about this in the book. And I thought that Ken went to the casting thing because he wanted to be on the show. And I was convinced that he would be on it because I'm like, you know what? He's actually a pretty charismatic, handsome person. But in reality, you know, one of the reasons he went was to – kind of asked this producer, like, why in this moment of multicultural acceptance and kind of alternative points of view, like, this is the 90s, like, why had there never been an Asian American male on the show? And, um, you know, she sort of dismissed it. She's like, ah, oh, they still have the personalities for it. And there was something we talked about a lot. Like, I would, I would still sort of make fun of him having gone in the first place and being like, who cares about MTV? Like the real world is stupid, all these things. But it was this moment where I could sort of glimpse one of our differences was that he actually was unafraid to want more out of out of these things that had shaped us. You know, even if it was something that I could dismiss in my kind of like read too much critical theory way about like the banality of television. Like these things had still shaped us. And I think he wanted to dream of something more. I get the impression from the book that he was a little bit more willing to 
open himself to the the disappointment yeah. of something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that he, you know, for quite a while, you know, like when I think about why I wrote this, part of it is because he is someone who's open-mindedness, who's like open, his, his open heart was something that I couldn't really appreciate, you know, when we were much younger. And it's something that I've thought about a lot. But yeah, he was definitely more willing to be disappointed because he was also willing to to demand more and to open himself up to to open himself up to ambitions of that scale is inevitably going to a much braver act than me kind of lobbing my spitballs from the corner. We'll wrap up with Washu in just a little bit. I mentioned at the top that his book Stay True is about his most intimate relationships. Later on, I'll talk with him about one that turned tragic. It's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. Since the dawn of time, man has dreamed of bringing life back from the dead. From Orpheus and Eurydice to Frankenstein's monster, resurrection has long been merely the stuff of myth, fiction, and fairy tale. Until now. Actually, we still can't bring people back from the dead. That would be crazy, but the Dead Pilot Society podcast has found a way to resurrect great dead comedy pilots from Hollywood's finest writers. Every month, Dead Pilot Society brings you a reading of a comedy pilot that was sold and developed but never produced, performed by the funniest actors from film and television. How does Dead Pilot Society achieve this miracle? The answer can only be found at MaximumFun.org. This is Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. I'm talking with writer Hua Xu. He's on staff at The New Yorker. His new memoir is called Stay True. You write so beautifully about your friend Ken that not knowing much about the book before I started reading it, I thought to myself, are they in love? Is that what this book is about? <laughs> like... Romant, like you kept talking about him being having an easier easier way with girls mm-hmm. and different kinds of relationships. Like, <laughs> I'm like, gosh, he like he's he writes so intimately about this guy. Like, I didn't know that about him, but uh, that's really interesting. I guess they're falling <laughs> in love. And late in this story, Ken is murdered, and it's a pretty random crime. Yeah. Very random. Yeah. And as one would imagine, it dramatically rearranges your life. Mm -hmm. And I started realizing that, you know, to the extent that the book was about themes, it wasn't so much about even necessarily like identity or even your relationship with this really special friend. But the question of like how and when you could tell a story, Mm -hmm. especially about yourself. Yeah. I was shocked to hear you talking about writing in the book about writing to him almost every day after he was killed. What led you to do that? And did it always feel like the right thing to be doing? Yeah, I mean, in a way, the book is... In a way, the book is about writing. You know, the book is about kind of why I've... It's just sort of something that's been in the back of my mind as I've worked as a writer for for um, almost twenty years. You know, immediate in the immediate aftermath when we all found out that he was no longer around, I just started writing because it seemed a natural way of uh, of coping, of of not being present, but just kind of honoring the present. At a very basic level, I just wanted to remember everything. I wanted the the inside jokes, you know, the the minor adventures. Like I wanted it all to be 
something that I could reflect on at a later date when I felt up to it. And so, yeah, I just immediately started writing. I, some of it was to him. Some of it was to myself, hoping that he was he was reading along somewhere else. And it's something that continued after that that week. I gave the eulogy, or I gave one of the, the eulogies at his funeral, and it was a collaborative effort. I think it was because I was always writing. Everyone was like, ah, you should just, you should probably do it since you already have some stuff written down. And after I finished, it felt so freeing in that moment to have found language to describe what I was feeling, what other people were feeling. And I sort of craved that sensation again. So I just continued writing. And for years, I would keep this journal. I would also just have these documents that would move from laptop to laptop to, to now desktop because I don't use laptops anymore. And I would just write about the past. And I would write about him. I would write to him. And so, yeah, I just sort of had 20, 22 years worth of notes accumulated when I actually sat down to, to write what became the book Stay True. Why did you think that you could write about it publicly when previously you had spent so long writing about it privately? I didn't think I could. Um, I wasn't sure I could. It seemed to me like a book, like earlier earlier in my life. Like it was just sort of something that I felt I needed to do. There are probably other forms of self-care or, or therapy that, you know, could have substituted for just relentlessly writing. But it's just something that I did and... I wasn't entirely sure that it was a book or that it would become a book. And it wasn't until, you know, fairly recently, I started writing this in 2019. Um, it wasn't until I wrote it that I knew I could actually write it, if that makes sense. Like, if I talked about it in 2019, 2020, it didn't materialize. But if I actually just sat down and tried to do it, like something would happen that had never happened before. And so I just sort of went with it. And when I was done, I was like, yeah, I guess, I guess there's some, there might be something here beyond kind of like 300 pages of me uh, vomiting onto a page. Did you think about how remarkable and unusual it is that this person that was you know, someone you knew for a few years changed your life so dramatically and stayed so close with you for so long, even after he wasn't around anymore? No. I mean, I didn't think that because I was experiencing it. And to some extent, maybe I was choosing to experience it, but it didn't really, um, I don't know, I didn't. I didn't think it was that weird. I mean, I don't know if it's weird, but it's kind of like to me, it doesn't strike me as weird at all, but it does strike me as kind of incredible. Like those circumstances can change your life so extraordinarily. I mean, it makes sense. It's not weird. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, incredible seems like, I thought it was unusual you know, like I think it was it was a deeply unusual thing to happen. And that kind of cast a a shadow over what followed. But um yeah, I mean I think for a lot of my friends, for a lot of people who he touched, um, it was a very difficult thing to move on from or to move forward with rather. And I was just one of those people. I happened to also just kind of choose a profession which would kind of compel me to think about other people or to think about people's stories or to think about meaning and beauty and, and things that would always return me to that original point where I would just be on this balcony debating with this person who I thought I had nothing in common with but who I think I ended up sharing um, a worldview with. There's a part in the book where you write about 
Puff Daddy Mm -hmm. rapping about Biggie being killed. Yeah. And obviously that song is, you know, the, one of the most maudlin hit records ever recorded. Like it couldn't be more. And there's a line in there that you highlight where Puffy says that it feels kind of weird. Well, it's kind of hard. Kind of hard. Yeah. yeah. And it's that kind of mm-hmm. that is so extraordinary about that line. Yeah. Because it so perfectly recognizes that, like, that death is so arbitrary and life is so arbitrary that we're like, here we are in life. Yeah. It felt so casual, you know, for him to put it that way. Like, it's kind of hard that you're not around. I think that's the line. And, you know, it's also just the euphemism of, like, not around. It was such a cheesy song to me before. But then after, I thought, you know, Puff nailed it. Like, it's kind of hard, you know. And just the interplay of, of like, 112, Faith Evans, Puff, like, it's, it's a great gesture. You know, I don't know if it's, like, the best song, but as a gesture, as a structure of like these three artists kind of taking turns, not necessarily trying to outdo one another, but trying to complement one another. I think it's just, it's kind of, it's kind of incredible, you know, when you think about it that way. But when I heard it before, I just thought like, this is so corny. But when I needed it, it was definitely something that meant something more to me. The book is your story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about you and it is from you. It is also a documentation of this person that you loved who can't speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. Were you scared of that part of it? Yeah, absolutely. I was terrified of that part of it. It is my story, and it is about me. And I think ultimately, like, I'm the only real caricature in the book. (laughs) Like, I think there's a lot about me that I'm poking fun at or maybe exaggerating for uh, for effect. But, um, you know, I've had people say that they get a very strong sense of who he was and his effect on people, but, but they can't necessarily picture him. Like, he's not necessarily rendered at this, in this molecular way. And I think that's probably somewhat intentional. Like, he does, you know, he's like a, like a like a hero almost to me. So it's very hard to kind of then reduce him to like flesh and bones. But I was very I was very anxious about doing that and just about um you know representing someone who who is so concerned about representation on one hand, but um I don't know, like I hope I hope I I wrote about him in a way that actually honors him. Well, Kwashu, I'm I'm so grateful to you for taking all this time to talk to me and for this beautiful book and, and your other work that I admire so much. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks so much for, you know, taking the time with the book and, and asking such incredible questions. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful. Kwashu, his new book is called Stay True. It's really something special. You can get it at your local bookstore. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is created from the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California. I actually was outside of greater Los Angeles, California this week. I headed up to Marin County because my brother-in-law, Danny, and his beautiful wife, Adriana, had a wedding reception. And it was really nice to see people, especially family and people that I loved. So... Congratulations, Danny and Adriana. Our show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our senior producer is Kevin Ferguson. Our producers are Jesus Ambrosio and Richard Roby. Our production fellow at Maximum Fun is Tabitha Myers. We get booking help from Mara Davis. Special thanks this week to Pat Stango at Penguin for recording our interview with Hua Xu. Our interstitial music is by DJW, also known as Dan Wally. Thanks to Dan for going with us to a comedy show the other day. We went to see Joe Parra. It was a lot of fun. 
Our theme song is called Huddle Formation. It was written and recorded by The Go Team. Thanks to The Go Team and to Memphis Industries, their label, for letting us use that song. Bullseye is on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. You can find us on all of those platforms, and we will share our interviews with you. Uh, I hope that you will then share them with others. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.